information systems. This chapter discusses the need for security to guard information systems and data as well as technologies used for secure information systems. Learning Objectives At the end of this chapter, students should be able to explain why information systems are vulnerable to disruption, error, and abuse. Describe the business value of security and control. Describe the components of an organizational framework for security and control and describe the tools and technologies used for safeguarding information resources. In order to safeguard information systems, today's businesses need for both security and control. Security means policies, procedures, and technical measures used to prevent unauthorized access, alteration, theft, or physical damage to information systems. And controls means methods, policies, and organizational procedures that ensure safety of organization's assets, accuracy and reliability of its accounting records, and operational adherence to management standards. This slide discusses the main categories of threats to information systems. Note that when large amounts of data are stored digitally on computers and servers and in databases, they are vulnerable to many more kinds of threats than when they were stored in manual form on paper in folders and file cabinets. When data are available over a network, there are even more vulnerabilities. For example, vulnerable to accessibility of networks, hardware problems, software problems, disasters, use of networks or computer outside of firm control, and loss and theft of portable devices. This graphic illustrates the types of threats to system security and the points over the network at which these threats are prevalent. Some problems occur at the client computer, others through the network lines, corporate servers, or in corporate hardware and software. This slide discusses the types of threats that large public networks such as the internet face because they are open to virtually anyone. Note that internet is so huge that when abuses do occur, they can have an enormously widespread impact. And when the internet becomes part of the corporate network, the organization's information systems are even more vulnerable to actions from outsiders. This slide discusses security threats related to wireless networks, local area networks or LANs using the 802.11 standard can be easily penetrated by outsiders armed with laptops, wireless cards, external antenna, and hacking software. Hackers use these tools to detect unprotected networks, monitor network traffic, and in some cases, gain access to the internet or to corporate networks. Note that there are stronger encryption and authentication systems available for wireless networks, but users must install them. Many Wi-Fi routers ship today with pre-installed security protection.
This graphic illustrates why wireless networks are vulnerable. The service set identifiers or SSIDs identifying the access points in a Wi-Fi network are broadcast multiple times, which as illustrated by the orange sphere and can be picked up fairly easily by intruders sniffer program. This slide identifies the various types of malware that threaten information systems and computers. Do you have ever had a problem with a virus? Do you know how they got infected? Note that there are now more than 200 viruses and worms targeting mobile phones and Web 2.0 applications such as MySpace and Blocks are new conduits for malware and spyware. Malware is a serious problem. Over the past decade, worms and viruses has caused billions of dollars of damage to corporate networks, immune systems, and data. This slide continues the discussion of types of malware on the previous slide. Note that SQL injection attacks are the largest malware threat. Do you know why? Because these attacks enable hackers access to underlying databases that support web applications such as sales of products and services, e-commerce, financial data, and other classified information. In other words, the database is where the information is located. SQL databases have little or no built-in security once a hacker gets beyond the entrance point to a corporate network. Spyware is software that aims to gather information about a person or organization without their knowledge. Spyware may send such information to another entity without the consumer's consent or that asserts control over a device without the consumer's knowledge. Spyware is mostly used for the purposes of tracking and storing internet users' movements on the web and serving up pop-up advertisement to internet users. Whenever spyware is used for malicious purposes, its presence is typically hidden from the user and can be difficult to detect. Some spyware, such as keyloggers, may be installed by the owner of a shared, corporate or public computer intentionally in order to monitor users. This slide looks at the people who commit computer crime and at the various types of computer crime. Do you know the difference between hackers and crackers? Have any of you been the victim of computer crime or invasion of privacy? To put it in simple terms, one may define a hacker as someone who identifies the flaws in the security system and work to improve them, while a cracker may be someone who unethically exploits the highly sensitive information and uses the flaws in the security systems to his advantage. The crackers usually breach the internet security and without paying royalties gain the access to various software. The hackers, on the other hand, are the internet security experts who may even be hired for locating and identifying the loopholes in the internet security systems and fix these loopholes and flaws. The hackers use their knowledge to help security system and the crackers use their knowledge to break the law and disrupt security. These two are sometimes called as white hats and black hats.
This slide continues the discussion of different types of computer crime. Do you know what the ultimate purpose of spoofing and sniffing are? Spoofing refers to actively introducing network traffic, pretending to be someone else. For example, spoofing is sending a command to computer A, pretending to be computer B. It is typically used in a scenario where you generate network packets that say they originated by computer B while they really originated by computer C. Spoofing in an email context means sending an email pretending to be someone else. Sniffing refer to listening to a conversation. For example, if you log into a website that uses no encryption, your username and password can be sniffed off the network by someone who can capture the network traffic between you and the website. Note that they are legitimate users of sniffing. Sniffers can help identify network trouble spots or spot criminal activity on a network. Sniffers can also be used to identify copyrighted data being sent over network, such as pirated music or video files. Denial of Service Attacks or DOS is a security event that occurs when an attacker flooding server with thousands of false requests to crash the network. What is the result of a DOS attack? The example is the Gram botnet, which was responsible for 18% of worldwide spam traffic in about 18 billion messages a day until it was shut down on July 19, 2012. Bots and botnets are an extremely serious threat because they can be used to launch very large attacks using many different techniques. This slide looks at the legal definition of computer crime and the two main classes of computer crime. Computer crime can be defined as any violations of criminal law that involves a knowledge of computer technology for their perpetration, investigation, or prosecution. The text lists a variety of other examples for computers as target and as instrument of crime. According to the Phonemon Institute, the median annual cost of cybercrime for organization in their study was $5.9 million. However, many companies are reluctant to report computer crimes. Why? What are the most economically damaging types of computer crime? which is DOS, introducing viruses, theft of services, or disruption of computer system. Identity theft occurs when someone uses another's personally identifying information like their name, identifying number, or credit card number without their permission to commit fraud or other crime while phishing is the attempt to obtain sensitive information such as usernames, password, and credit card details often for malicious reasons by disguising as a trustworthy entity in an electronic communication. Phishing is typically carried out by email spoofing or instant messaging and it often directs users to enter personal information at a fake website. An evil twin is a fraudulent Wi-Fi access point that appears to be legitimate set up to eavesdrop on wireless communication. The evil twin is, is the wireless LAN equivalent of the phishing scan. This type of attack may be used to steal the password of unsuspecting users 
either by monitoring their connection or by phishing, which involves setting up a fraudulent website and luring people there. Farming is a scamming practice in which malicious code is installed on a personal computer or server, misdirecting users to fraudulent websites without their knowledge or consent. Farming has been called phishing without a lure. Click fraud is an illegal practice that occurs when individuals click on a website's click through advertisement, either banner advertisement or paid text links, to increase the payable number of clicks to the advertiser. The illegal clicks could either be performed by having a person manually click the advertising hyperlinks or by using automated software or online bots that are programmed to click this banner advertisement and pay per click text advertisement links. This slide looks at another source of security problem, which employees. Employees is, is the people inside the company with access to the system. Have you ever worked somewhere with a vulnerable password system? Have you ever revealed to anyone what is your password? And what do you think are some solutions to password security? Some financial institutions assign users a new password every day or every hour or every week. And some organization will use social engineering technique which this technique tricking employees into revealing their password by pretending to be legitimate members of the company who in need of information by from this technique the organization will know will able to know among those employees who reveal the password This slide looks at security and other vulnerabilities caused by software errors that open networks to intruders. The text cites the example of a database-related software error that prevented millions of JP Morgan Chase retail and small business customers from assessing their online bank accounts for two days in September 2010. The text also gives the example of Microsoft Service Pack upgrades to its operating system software. Service Pack 1 for the Vista included security enhancements to counter malware and hackers. Failed computer systems can lead to significant or total loss of business function because firms now are more vulnerable than ever. For example, the confidentiality, personal and financial data, trade secrets, new products and strategies. A security breach may cut into a firm's market value almost immediately. Inadequate security and controls also bring forth issues of liability. For example, BJ's Wholesale Club, which was sued by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission for allowing hackers to access its systems and steal credit and debit card data for fraudulent purchase. This slide continues the look at the business value of security and control, examining the legal requirements for electronic records management. Note that the Sabanus Oxley Act was designed to protect investors after the scandals of Enron, WorldCom, and other public companies. Sabanus Oxley is fundamentally about ensuring that internal controls are in place to govern the creation and documentation of information in financial statements. 
because managing this data involves information systems. Information systems must implement controls to make sure this information is accurate and to enforce integrity, confidentiality, and accuracy. This slide continues the discussion of the business value of security and control. Security, control, and electronic records management are essential today for responding to legal action. Note that in legal action, a firm is obligated to respond to a discovery request for access to information that may be used as evidence and the company is required by law to produce those data. The cost of responding to a discovery request can be enormous if the company has trouble assembling the required data or the data have been corrupted or destroyed. Courts impose severe financial and even criminal penalties for improper destruction of electronic documents. Given the legal requirement for electronic records, it is important that an awareness of computer forensics should be incorporated into a firm's contingency planning process. This slide lists the different categories of general control. Protection of information resources requires a well-designed set of controls. Computer systems are controlled by a combination of general controls and application controls. General control govern the design, security, and use of computer programs and the security of data files in general throughout the organization's information technology infrastructure. General control includes software control, hardware controls, computer operation controls, data security controls, controls over the system's implementation process, and administrative controls. This slide examines the second type of information system controls, which is application controls. Application controls include both automated and manual procedures that ensure that only authorized data are completely and accurately processed by that application. Application controls can be classified as input controls, processing controls, and output controls. Input controls check data for accuracy and completeness when they enter the system. There are specific input controls for input authorization, data conversion, data editing, and error handling. Processing controls establish that data are complete and accurate during updating. Run control totals, computer matching, and program edit checks are used as processing controls. Output controls ensure that the result of computer processing are accurate, complete, and properly distributed. This slide looks at another important factor in establishing an appropriate framework for security and control, which is risk assessment. Although not all risk can be anticipated and measured, most businesses should be able to identify many of the risks they face. The table illustrates sample result of a risk assessment for an online order processing system that processes 30,000 orders per day. The likelihood of each exposure occurring over a one-year period is expressed as a percentage. The expected annual loss is the result of the multiplying the probability by the average loss. This slide looks at the need for a firm to establish a security policy for protecting a company's assets as well as other company policies that security policy drives and how information systems support this. 
The text provides the example of the security policy at Unilever, a multinational consumer goods company which requires every employee with a laptop or mobile handheld to use an approved device and employ a password or other method of identification when logging onto the corporate network. This slide looks at the area of security policy involved in managing identities of system users. Identity management is the task of controlling information about users on computers. Such information includes information that authenticates the identity of a user and information that describes information and action they are authorized to access and or perform. It also includes the management of descriptive information about the user and how and by whom that information can be accessed and modified. This graphic illustrates the security allowed for two sets of users of a personnel database that contains sensitive information such as employee salaries and medical histories. One set of users consists of all employees who perform clerical functions, such as inputting employee data into the system. All individuals with this type of profile can update the system but can neither read nor update sensitive fields such as salary, medical history, or earning data. Another profile applies to a divisional manager who cannot update the system but who can read all employee data fields for his or her division, including medical history and salary. These security profiles are based on access rules supplied by business groups in the firm. This slide continues the discussion of essential activities a firm performs to maximize security and control, here looking at planning for activities should a disaster occur, such as a flood, earthquake, or power outage. Note that disaster recovery plans focus primarily on the technical issues involved in keeping systems up and running, such as which files to back up and the maintenance of backup computer systems or disaster recovery services. For example, Mastercard Company, which maintains a duplicate computer center in Kansas City, Missouri, to serve as an emergency backup to its primary computer center in St. Louis. This slide looks at the technologies used for identifying and authenticating users. Passwords are traditional methods for authentication and newer methods include tokens, smart cards and biometric authentication. Security tokens are physical devices used to gain access to an electronically restricted resource. For example, a wireless key card opening a locked door or in the case of a customer trying to access their bank account online, the use of a bank provided token can prove that the customer is who they claim to be. Things that can be used for biometric authentication such as voices, irises, fingerprints, palm prints and face recognition. This slide looks at an essential tool used to prevent intruders from accessing private networks, which is firewalls. To create a strong firewall, an administrator must maintain detailed internal rules identifying the people, applications, or addresses that are allowed or rejected. Firewalls can deter, but not completely prevent, network penetration by outsiders and should be viewed as one element in an overall security plan. The technologies include in the firewall is static packet filtering, stateful inspection, network address translation, and application proxy filtering. And these are often used in combination.
This graphic illustrates the use of firewalls on a corporate network. The firewall is placed between the firm's private network and the public internet or another distrusted network to protect against unauthorized traffic. Notice that here, a second inner firewall protects the web server from access through the internal network. This slide looks at additional tools to prevent unwanted intruders and software from accessing the network, such as intrusion detection systems, antivirus and anti-spyware software, and unified threat management systems. Intrusion detection systems monitors hotspots on corporate networks to detect and deter intruders. An antivirus and anti-spyware software will check computers for presence of malware and can often eliminate it as well. For antivirus and anti-spyware software, it requires continual updating. Do you know why these tools require continual updating? It is important to constantly update the antivirus software on a computer because computers are regularly threatened by new viruses. The antivirus updates contain the latest files needed to combat new viruses and protect your computer. This slide looks at the tools and technologies used to secure wireless networks. Wireless security is the prevention of unauthorized access or damage to computers using wireless networks. The most common types of wireless security are wired equivalent privacy or WEP and Wi-Fi protected access WPA. This slide introduces the use of encryption to ensure that data traveling along networks cannot be read by unauthorized users. Encryption is a mechanism that protects your valuable information such as your documents, pictures or online transactions from unwanted people assessing or changing it. Encryption works by using a mathematical formula called a cipher and a key to convert a readable data, which is plain text, into a form that others cannot understand, into a cipher text. Two methods for encryption on networks. Number one, secure sockets layer and successor transport layer security. Number two, secure hypertext transfer protocol, also known as SHTTP. This slide discusses two methods of encryption, which are symmetric key encryption and public key encryption. Can you explain the difference between symmetric key encryption and public key encryption? In symmetric key encryption, the sender and receiver establish a secure internet session by creating a single encryption key and sending it to the receiver so both the sender and receiver share the same key. Meanwhile, public key encryption uses two key, one shared or public and one totally private. The keys are mathematically related so that data encrypted with one key can be decrypted using only the other key. To send and receive messages, communicators first create separate pairs of private and public keys. The public keys is kept in a directory and the private key must be kept secret. The sender encrypts a message with the recipient's public key. On receiving the message, the recipient uses his or her private key to decrypt it. This graphic illustrates the steps in public key encryption. The sender encrypts data using the public key of the recipient. The data encrypted with this public key can only be decrypted with the recipient's private key.
This slide looks at the use of digital certificate as a tool to help protect online transactions. Digital certificates are used in conjunction with public key encryption to validate the identities of two parties in a transaction before data is exchanged. This graphic illustrates the process for using digital certificates. The institutions or individual request a certificate over the internet from a certification authorities or CA. The certificate received from the CA can then be used to validate a transaction with an online merchant or customer. Last but not least, to protect firms' assets are not just physical computing hardware, but include the information stored on computers and networks. Years of critical personal information and sensitive documents can be lost or destroyed without a plan for securing them and a good backup and recovery plan. Thank you all.